Thank you, Simon. Thank you for having me here. And thank you to uh, the Lawrence Stern Trust as well for having me at Shandy Hall and uh, to Patrick for organizing that. Um, it's great to be here. Again, I was here uh, four years ago working on a piece uh, with um, Lawrence Stern's The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy. And now I'm back here uh, working on a uh, three pieces actually for A Sentimental Journey, which is uh, it's now his, uh, it's a second novel and it's the 250th anniversary uh, of that book. So it's really a, a great opportunity to be here and to uh, share my work with, with everybody that's here. Um, we'll start out, this is uh, a piece that I did while I was still uh, in college <clears throat> called Visual Braille. I'm a little bit thrown off from the uh, technical, okay. Um, and before I started working with books, I was primarily working uh, as a painter and I was working with language and I was working at a sign shop at the time during, uh, in the evenings while I was going to school and was really fascinated with uh, Braille and the idea, this cliche of art as a universal language and the fact that there really isn't anything that's a universal language because there's either a physical or cultural uh, obstruction um, between any type of communication and also sort of that obstruction between what we actually want to say, what we mean to say, and the communication, uh, whether it's text or television or um, a cable uh, that didn't work right, that um, there's always sort of a, a barrier between uh, actual content and uh, the way that it's um, communicated out in the world. So I was thinking about Braille and the fact that it's a, a very non-visual uh, way of communication and wanted to make it visual. So. I took a glue bottle and put some gesso in it and created the, the braille bumps and thought about uh, how a finger would run over that braille and actually read it, which created these visual biomorphic shapes. So this painting itself is, uh, I'll speak in inches because I'm from the US, <laughs> it's 40 inches by 96 inches. So it's about, about one meter by three meters. And each character is about this high. So it really feels more like a sign than it does uh, a page. and. I painted it all with my fingers to and tried to connect the dots to uh, sort of create that biomorphic shape and create a visual representation of that tactile sensation that somebody would feel while they're reading. Um, so the last two words in this text are my name, Brian Detmer. Uh, so if you uh, have the time and uh, would like this file, you can end up uh, transcribing it, translating it, but it basically the text itself is about the idea of the piece within the piece. So here's another piece called Crash. This is just uh, eight inches by eight inches. And what I wanted to do is create a tactile illustration that as somebody was reading, they're essentially feeling uh, the picture. So the story is about a car crash and they're feeling that crash uh, as opposed to um, you know, people that aren't visually impaired, when we're reading, we're reading the text and we're looking at the image. Here there's more of a synthesis between the uh, material and the uh, content that it's um, portraying. <clears throat> so after I got out of uh, school, I started playing around with books and I was ripping up books and applying them to the canvas and sort of uh, applying the pages and ripping them off again and playing around with this idea of this universal language that's sort of lost. And uh, this piece is called Huckleberries. It contains 17 copies of Huckleberry Finn, uh, different editions. And so as I continue to uh, add and remove all of the pages, it becomes less and less legible. So it really does become more of a visual or tactile uh, experience. So I was, I'm ripping up books at the time, and this is around the year 2000. Uh, this piece is from 2001. And I was feeling really guilty about ripping up uh, books, but I was also sort of intrigued by why I was feeling guilty, what books mean to us, and uh, what was happening with books around the year 2000 as more and more people were using the internet and uh, information was um, becoming more online and books were becoming less essential uh, to our day-to-day -day use. So this was one of the first pe book pieces I created. It's called alternate route to knowledge. And what I really wanted to have sort of a stack of books that somebody might see in a gallery. And as they walk up to the, or from further away, they might just think it's a stack of books, but I really wanted that initial shock of then coming up closer and seeing this really rough hole kind of dug into it. Um, and at the time my roommate had a cat and uh, the cat I realized uh, got you know as much information through senses of touch 
and smell as it did through sight. Um, so I was really thinking about the sense of touch and the sense of smell and that really um, physical uh, experience that we have when we open up an old book and what can be learned by that, um, by that tactile or physical experience as much as by the um, literal or literary experience uh, with a book. So as I was diving in and just digging these rough holes, I um, sort of had my eureka moment around 2001 and I just uh, sealed the book on the edges and I carved into the front of it and I came across an image and it was kind of interesting. I wasn't really thinking about what I was doing and I started to carve around that image and remove a few pages and then a, another image appeared. And it was really exciting for me because it was literally like reading. I had no idea what was going to come on the next page as I was going. And so I thought it was really uh, an exciting sort of visual sculptural uh, metaphor for reading itself and also a new way to look at the book. Um, as we get information online now, everything is sort of juxtaposed um, and layered in, and uh, there's not necessarily a line linear narrative or a connection between the different pages and the different links that we experience through uh, as we travel through information digitally, um, which is also the case with reference books because they're organized alphabetically, but there's no, you know, no connection necessarily between an aardvark and an apple. So reference books are already uh, structured in a nonlinear way, even though the format of the book is a very linear structure. Um, so I work with a lot of nonfiction books, reference books primarily, uh, books that aren't as functional that we don't really use anymore. Um, but I like all the books that I work with to have a history, so I rarely work with uh, brand new books. Um, but sometimes I'm working with someone else's uh, literature or someone else's artwork. So when I'm, work when I'm doing that, I sort of think of it as a, a remix. So this is Norman Rockwell's uh, magazine covers. So I dived into the Norman Rockwell paintings and discovered that he sort of had a, and, you know, I wanted to find something that was sort of uh, a typo, typical clean Americana and uh, sort of find that gritty uh, underpainting to it. Um, so you can see here, it was Norman Rockwell magazine covers that turned into No Man Will Gaze Over. And here's a, a detail of that. Um, but what I found was Norman Rockwell had this weird fascination with wounds. Um, there were a lot of stubbed toes and different uh, you know, bandages and uh, people constantly getting hurt, which is sort of a physical manifestation of mischief. Um, but I also, I, so I sort of wanted to accentuate that, but also sort of um, you know, turn that innocent Boy Scout camping trip situation into uh, you know, a more psychedelic um, hallucinogenic experience. So really, with um, all the pieces that I work on, I'm sealing the edges and carving into the surface, and I'm not moving or adding anything. It's a completely sculptural, subtractive process. So everything you see in my work is exactly where it's always been in the book. And I'm kind of strict about this rule that I've set up for myself. And in a way, it sort of frees me um, and allows me to be more creative within, those, uh, within these constricted rules. But it also allows the book itself to be uh, to tell its story in a new way and for it to be more of a collaboration uh, between me and the material. Because my work is really about information, it's about the book, it's about the way uh, what's happening with the book now that um, we're sort of losing that physical existence of information. Um, and it's, you know, it's about the way uh, the restrictions of the book and also the, the freedom that the book allows. Um, the uh, structure of a book being linear from front to back is uh, taking you through the space as you're reading through a book, but it really takes you through time as well. So as you're traveling through the pages, through the space of a book, you're really traveling through time um, as you, you're reading, unless you're working with a book like Tristram Shandy, which is <laughs> taking you all over the place. But you are going through this linear narrative. So what I found was by approaching the back of the book, you're actually uh, sort of, this is a, an art history book and it starts uh, sort of with the medieval times and goes into the modern era. And I realized that if I seal it up and approach it from the back, I'm sort of entering from the modern era and traveling back through time. So you can see some of the uh, Modrian lines here uh, that uh, create this framing here, and then some uh, Renaissance paintings and some medieval uh, textures. And so 
what's interesting about that, that structure of the book is that there really is a parallel between space and time that we are losing now that we're getting everything online, which is really what makes the book uh, the ideal format for the novel or for long form fiction. But it really um, was always sort of a clumsy material for reference material, because if you want to look something up uh, on, on the internet, you can just go right to that word. But with a, an encyclopedia or a dictionary, you have to uh, scroll through and travel and find that, and whatever definition you're looking for or information you're looking for isn't necessarily connected to what uh, is around it. So in a way, I'm trying to uh, accentuate that juxtaposition, accentuate and illustrate uh, that tactile sensation of the book and also sort of um, thinking about what happens online and applying that to the book itself. So we don't really think of the book as a form of technology, but it is. It's a, a communication technology, even though it's not a mechanical technology. But the book really is a machine. Um, so I do think of the, the book as a machine. It's a tool, uh, a communication tool. And so a lot of the ways I approach the book itself is sort of a metaphor for a way to, to look at that the book itself. So I began uh, in the early 2000s with this basic format of sealing up the book and cutting into the surface and um, slowly began to push the, the format of the book itself to really allow it to become more sculptural. So this is just one single dictionary rolled up in on itself and then carved into it. So in a way, it's allowing me to create a sculpture in a 360 degree uh, ways that can, that can be seen from all angles and to sort of break that front and back format that the book has, but also thinking about information in this uh, concealed information loop in a way. So in this piece, the book almost becomes stone or it becomes wood, but it also becomes this uh, continuous loop that's um, sort of referencing itself. So as I took off the cover it, and uh, rolled it up, it's almost as if um, you take an animal out of its shell and it sort of uh, insulates itself to protect itself. It's rolling in on itself. And then, of course, my intervention is, uh, you know, a little bit violent, a little bit, um, you know, I use uh, X-Acto knives, craft knives, and tweezers, and it's almost a, a surgical process. So there is some violence and um, some threat of loss that I'm trying to suggest, but I'm also trying to balance that with uh, honoring the beauty of the book, the history of the book, and, uh, Really, I want people to contemplate uh, what is happening as our information is going online and as we're losing physical, uh, tactile uh, copies of our personal and cultural ideas. So this is, all, this is just one single uh, dictionary as well. So within the dictionary itself, I want to kind of expose that, that inner architecture, that structure, that um, the uh, scaffolding that really holds the information together. And uh, a lot of times when I'm working with a book, uh, I'm trying to maximize as much as I can possibly get out of it. And I'm almost thinking of it as a scientific process, as if I'm a computer program and I just, everything I come across, I'm going to expose and, and uh, optimize the, the visual and sculptural experience of the piece. So that in a way, there's so much time put into it. Uh, Duchamp took the urinal that had no artistic meaning and uh, gave it meaning by putting it in the museum. And in a way, I'm almost trying to reverse engineer that, where I take something that's so loaded with meaning, uh, you know, literal meanings, and kind of crack that open in order to, uh, of course, it's not losing meaning, the, the meaning's transferring, but in a way, I'm kind of erasing that meaning as well um, by manipulating it and distorting it into becoming something new. Uh, this piece is called Webster Withdrawn. So uh, as opposed to sort of maximizing the uh, amount of images, I did the exact opposite in this piece and wanted to suggest that idea of loss um, within the piece. So I was carving around the images, uh, swerving away from things of interest and really exposing all that negative space on the pages uh, between everything. And of course, there's a silhouette of Daniel Webster on the left here, um, which is the most you know, popular dictionary or was the most popular dictionary uh, at least in the U.S., most commonly used. Um, so I have worked with Webster's Dictionaries quite a bit. Um, but I, I want to suggest that idea of loss. You know, this is almost like uh, what happens with your computer hard drive over time. 
and what happens with your files. Everything is uh, engineered to fail. Um, everything digital is anti-archival because it's, they want you to constantly have to buy new equipment, you have to buy new software, you have to buy new programs. Um, it's all driven by capitalism, but it's really in, against the interest of the archive. So for a while, um, when things be became digital, everybody thought, well, we should, put, we should transfer everything digitally because there might be a fire in this building or we might lose these books, but we've all learned over the last 10, 15, 20 years that something physical right in front of you is much more stable, uh, much more um, plastic, you know, much, uh, you know, it won't uh, deteriorate. It won't uh, become manipulated uh, as much as a digital file will over time. So one of the things I'm trying to do is uh, take what, what happens digitally, you know, and, and apply that to the book itself. This is also just one single copy of uh, Webster's Dictionary, um, sanded down. So I use tools uh, like belt sanders and, and I use a varnish that uh, is really sort of undetectable once it, once it dries on the piece. So I had this in uh, one of my first shows in New York years ago. And uh, there was a carpenter looking at the, the piece and he was about three feet away. He was asked, then he asked me what type of wood it was. <laughs> so the, uh, the illusion had uh, successfully transferred because this is only the book itself, there's nothing additional. So there's this idea of um, the material reverting to you know, the original uh, material of wood. Uh, but within this piece, there's also this idea of sort of a mound, um, an archeology span that you know, right below the surface of, of the ground or right below the surface of any material, there's information uh, or there's history right below that that can help you learn more about about what you're looking at. This is one of my first uh, multi-book pieces. It's a full set of encyclopedias called New Books of Knowledge. And I'm thinking about the idea of a landscape, but also this uh, multicellular organism and uh, early uh, life forms um, on this planet. And so I connected each book and sanded them together uh, in order to create one large uh, sort of landscape. And then um, as I'm going through an encyclopedia, I'm not moving it or adding anything, but I can, uh, almost like Sol LeWitt, I can set up a predetermined set of rules for myself. How am I gonna approach this? How am I going to curate all of this content? So within this piece, I uh, specifically uh, exposed images that had to do with geography and with land and uh, with the sanding of the, the pages themselves, I was really able to, uh, you know, illustrate that that strata, those uh, those different levels within the the book itself. So it becomes a landscape, it becomes stone, but it also, in a way, becomes liquid. Um, a lot of my work is about this idea of loss uh, or erosion, and thinking of uh, information in books as solids and information online uh, digitally as liquid because it can be manipulated, it can be transformed much easier. Uh, every image on your computer can be, trans you know, it's just zeros and ones. Uh, every, you know, every text on, on a computer is just zeros and ones and that can translate, you know, you can turn the text into music, you can turn the image into uh, text, basically into code. Um, so I'm thinking about these things as I'm working with books and really trying to push uh, the level of what can happen with them. So this is another full set of encyclopedias uh, with this idea of water sort of washing through it, almost like a water wheel or some sort of, sort of uh, you know, fantastic machine. Um, and this idea that as the water is sort of reading through the book, it's also washing away information. It's becoming lost and it's eroding over time. Um, one of the reasons I think that we value books and we don't like to see them destroyed is that we really do think of it as a living thing. Um, the book really is a body. It's a living thing because there was so much energy put into it, but then it has that potential to continue to grow and continue to uh, inspire and become something new every time someone else picks it up and rereads it. So I really do think of the book as a body. And of course, the size and scale and weight of a book is related to our own bodies so that we can hold it in our hands and you know look at it with our, with our heads. So. Um, I've worked with a series of anatomy books which are just fascinating visually already. This one's from about the 1930s. So again, working with something that doesn't have a function anymore. Um, and 
I am suggesting this idea of loss, but I'm always working with books that uh, there are other copies out there. So I will sacrifice one for my own interests, but, um, and I wanna suggest this idea of death or of loss, uh, and I am participating in that to a degree, but uh, not to the degree where I'm actually destroying something that can't be replaced. Because everything I'm working with, uh, you know, was printed in the, in the thousands, if not more. But, you know, you can see the marbling of the, the page on the side here really becomes uh, part of the, the body of the book itself. So this is a piece that I did around 2004, um, before I've discovered a couple of other artists that were working in a similar way. But I uh, casted my own face uh, in uh, dental alginate, which is what dentists use to make casts. Um, so it was really quite a funny scene. I uh, put a condom on my head to keep my, <laughs> to keep my hair from it and put my face down in there and I had a straw so I could breathe and I put on a 30 minute long song so that I knew exactly how long I had to, to cast my face. And then I sliced that like a loaf of bread and used that as a template in order to then transcribe to the book itself. So this is just a uh, Grolier. Uh, it's a full set of 10 encyclopedias. Um, it's not really a self-portrait uh, as much as my face was the easiest one to use, but um, really thinking of this idea uh, of the, you know, the book as a body or the book as a, as a living thing. So I took that a step further and worked on another full set of encyclopedias and created this piece, which is called Tab, The Boy That Knew Too Much. Um, of course, the, uh, you know, the tabs on the side of the encyclopedia um, inspired that name. So um, also playing around with the, uh, the dichotomy, the uh, contrast between um, geometric minimalism and figurative work uh, within this piece. But uh, since doing these figures, I've discovered uh, one artist that had preceded me, so I stopped working this way, and uh, of course there's been dozens of artists copying that artist since then. Um, so I touched on earlier that, you know, there's this, um, I love this idea of like forensic science, this idea that right below the surface of the ground or even the surface of that microphone, there's information about where it was created, where the metal came from, what year it might be. So right below any surface, below the, uh, the surface of wood, there's information about where it came from. So thinking about uh, not a literary way to approach material, but a more of a forensic uh, scientific way of figuring out what is just beyond the surface. I took um, several hundred romance novels and spliced them into thin uh, pieces and then pressed them, uh, rolled them up, compressed them, and then sanded them to create this, this surface. So you can see the side of the piece here so within that material, uh, which is the, the thickness of a paperback, about three and a half inches, um, there's thousands and thousands of uh, pages and hundreds and hundreds of stories um, sort of contained uh, that are sort of inaccessible. So in a way, this is sort of um, like a hard drive that, that broke, you know, because you know that the information's there, but it's no longer obtainable, it's no longer legible. So the books are really my primary thing, but it's um, part of a, a larger uh, conversation, a larger project working with other forms of analog media that uh, we no longer use the way we used to now that we do everything digitally. So I've worked with maps and cassette tapes and records. Um, this is one of my early map pieces. This is actually the Midwest, uh, United States. Um, so I took all 50 state maps and carved out everything except for the highways and then created six uh, unique pieces, each one for a different region of the US. And in a way, it's sort of uh, an illustration of the synapses in your brain that you might uh, sort of feel like while you're you know, traveling through traffic. And then each map itself is, uh, has a layer of glass in between it. So what was interesting is uh, discovering how the uh, landscape, uh, the Midwest being very flat, allowed for a very nice grid um, but the uh, Southwest being very hilly and everything created a very different uh, feeling within the piece. So the, the roads that we create, the structure of our cities, of course, uh, aren't just dropped onto the planet. The, the landscape that uh, preceded our, our cities or our developments really informed uh, the structure of the way uh, the roads are made and the way we move through space. Um, these are National Geographic maps, and I did a series of pieces where I uh, created these hands, and this is actually the size of a real hand. Uh, 
uh, thinking about, and they're all islands. Um, so this, I believe, is uh, the Indonesian islands, uh, thinking about the history of colonialism um, that uh, people here in England and you know in the U.S. we uh, have a long history with, and the idea of uh, sort of grabbing these islands and uh, taking them essentially. Um, so there's, you know, just within this small map that's just the size of a hand, uh, you know, there's sort of a lot of uh, loaded history with uh, the way larger countries have dealt with uh, smaller, uh, you know, more isolated countries in the past. And this is a map of Barcelona. So I took it to the, uh, you know, there's a lot of humor in my work as well. Um, so some of it, you know, sort of, I want it to be interesting and of course have uh, many layers, but um, you know, just the idea of carving into a book uh, or you know, manipulating a map into you know, become our bloodstream, there's, uh, you know, there's some humor behind the, the work itself as well. So this is just um, one single cassette tape, The Best of the Kinks, uh, and uh, it's only about this big, and it was my first cassette tape piece. So it was around 2004, 2005, that I was thinking of, um, and people were still actually using cassette tapes, usually only in old cars. Um, now even old, you know, most of those cars probably don't even run anymore uh, 10, 15 years later. But um, I was walking on the sidewalk in Chicago, uh, which is where I'm originally from, and saw a dead bird and it just kind of clicked right away and I thought, uh, you know, what a great metaphor to think of the, the music itself as sort of a living thing that kind of flies through the air and the white plastic of the uh, cassette tape is, a, is an exoskeleton. Um, so using uh, heat guns and little saws and knives, uh, translating you know, just one single cassette tape um, and letting it morph into this, uh, this little skeleton. So I like this idea that I'm not using any additional materials. So it's really um, you know, one thing that uh, is sort of manipulated into, into something else. So, of course, I had to work on a series of uh, skulls, thinking of the idea, the, the connections between um, some of the music that I, uh, you know, am embarrassed to admit that I used to listen to when I was uh, in seventh grade, um, when cassette tapes were really big. Um, the connections between rock and roll and this uh, imagery of death, but then also this idea of piracy uh, and this idea of, of course, the cassette tape being, being dead. But I uh, haven't really done any cassette pieces since about 2009, 2010. I feel like I sort of um, did everything I could with uh, those pieces. This is the inside of the a bowl skull eye. You have a uh, Bob Dylan there. So another uh, form of media that I grew up with that many of you may not have even uh, ever had to use is uh, the VHS tape. Um, so. Uh, along with cassette tapes, I was thinking of a way to work with VHS tapes, and I wanted to manipulate them to become something else. So this is a, a rose bush I created from about a dozen VHS tapes, uh, manipulating the, pl the plastic in order to become the branches, and then the leaves and the flowers uh, from the actual tape itself. Um, and what's interesting, and uh, I'm not a caveman, but conceptually it's really hard to wrap my, to really think about the fact that uh, there's such a distance between the content and the form uh, of our information. And the more technology goes along, the further the content and the form uh, are connected. So what's great about a book is that the form of the book and the content uh, really sort of interplay. And when I'm letting the content of the book itself actually dictate the form of the piece, there's really sort of a melting together. Um, but if you think of the history of film, it began as actual film where on the film you could see the actual image. It was, you know, actually being projected. And then from that film, it went to uh, VHS so that it became black essentially uh, so that there is no visual um, on the actual material itself. It has to be uh, reinterpreted through a machine. Um, and then we went to DVDs, of course, which became reflective. And then now we're just with a, you know, digital technology where it's all just ones and zeros and it has no physical appearance. So as technology has evolved, there's actually less of a connection between the content and uh, 
the, the material or the, the, the form of communication that we're using in order to uh, transcribe that information. So working with uh, Rosebush, I thought, well, what would be interesting to work on and I th to make a Rosebush out of? I thought, well, it could be romance or it could just be a bunch of porn. So I uh, found myself in the back of a video store uh, finding some old VHS tapes, uh, which were hard to find even at that time, and rummaging through to find the, the right material. So um, who knows what type of images are on that flower? Probably don't want to know. Um, this is one of my record pieces that I worked on, and uh, of course Christian Marclay has really uh, done as much as you possibly can think of with the record. Um, but I was thinking about the structure of time and uh, the way it works with a book and the way it works with a record. And with a record, of course, time travels in a spiral. So what I wanted to do initially was undo that spiral and uh, using a, a router, essentially unwrapping the record and letting it stretch out and become its own thing. So I worked with a Muddy Waters um, record, um, who of course is a famous blues musician uh, from the south, uh, from the Mississippi Delta that moved up to Chicago. So this is actually a map of the Mississippi Delta, but down by New Orleans, uh, of the Mississippi River going up to Chicago. And of course Muddy Waters is named after the Mississippi River, Mississippi Muddy Waters. And what I found really interesting is that the shape of the river itself actually became a profile of Muddy Waters as you um, jump over from the Miss Mississippi River over to Chicago. So in a way, the path of the blues, the path of his own life uh, visually mirrors uh, his actual silhouette. So a lot of times when I have one idea or two ideas, like a third or a fourth thing will sort of click into place and that's when I know I'm sort of onto something and that there's you know something really kind of interesting happening that's beyond my control. Um, so as our information gets more compressed, uh, it becomes harder to access, it becomes more manipulated. So this is just one single record. Uh, the police synchronicity, um, again unwrapped, on un, you know sort of cut into a very long strand and then compressed as much as possible. So this piece is only about this large. And thinking about this idea that we're losing resolution, we're losing access as things become more compressed. Um, of course, our information is uh, more compressed than anything on our laptops or online. And uh, almost like animals themselves, our technology is evolving so that the larger forms really don't have the space to exist anymore. And it's really the smaller and smaller and the quicker um, our technology can adapt and the quicker it can be manipulated from one form to the other, uh, the more likely it is to, to survive. So when I'm working through a book, I, um, as you saw in some of the earlier images, I really like to uh, maximize the images within the book itself. Um, but I also work with text and I think of the text as sort of a physical poetry. Um, so. I'm kind of thinking about the way images work and the way text works. And what really happens is when we're looking at an image, we're using text, we're using language in our minds in order to interpret that image. So every time we see something and we make sense of it, we're actually using language in order to, um, to make sense to ourselves. But when we're reading, we're creating images in our head. So it's really sort of a, a yin yang. There's a, sort of a, a mirrored reflection. So text really can't exist without us reading it. Um, you know, it's sort of that cliche of a, does a tree make a sound if it, you know, if it falls in the wood and there's nobody to hear it? You know, can a, does a book really contain anything until we start to read it? You know, so really as we're reading text, we're creating images in our head. And as we're looking at images, we uh, use language, text in our own minds uh, in order to understand that. So there's always sort of that yin yang, that those puzzle pieces that fit together. So. Um, in a way, you know, sort of the two hemispheres, uh, the two parts of the brain. Um, this was one of the first fictional uh, works that I worked with, and this is Brave New World, and it's seven, uh, no, I'm sorry, 14, seven on each side, different editions of uh, Brave New World, and really kind of carving through there, creating these two hemispheres. Uh, this is the size of a brain, and really thinking about uh, the poetry um, behind that text, and uh, this idea that um, 
when we're uh, experiencing life, we're experiencing fragments, um, whether it through, be through space or through time, we experience all these things that are sort of juxtaposed together that don't necessarily have a linear narrative. It's all these isolated fragments that we put together and create a linear narrative. We create a plot in order to sort of understand um, what we're experiencing in order to, in order to uh, share those stories with other people. So I like the idea that I'm kind of breaking those narratives back apart, breaking those images apart, um, sort of more to a um, experiential level so that um, then the viewer can come in and uh, they might find it to be completely random or completely dada, um, but they can also make connections, find some of the connections that I might have found myself or create new c connections uh, within those images and with those, within the, the relationship of the, the text itself. So the, this, is, of course, is uh, um, the double helix of the DNA structure. And uh, it was actually commissioned for Science Magazine um, for the people that were working about uh, six years ago now um, on the program that isolates every word through everything that, um, all the literature between 1800 and 2000 that had been scanned and digitized. And they created this program where you can look up a word and see how often it had been used through, throughout time and what type of um, books it had been uh, used in. So it's sort of a new way of doing research. So if you look up you know, a term like sushi, you can see that it got popular in the 1980s and kind of went off from there. But it really wasn't used in literature uh, too much before then. So really kind of a new way to uh, access each individual word, a new way of research, and um, kind of playing around with that, that idea. And again, this idea of erosion or this idea of uh, sort of water washing down the machine. So here's some of the isolated poetry that uh, comes with and that I sort of uh, find within the piece. And it's um, in a way, it's what, what Tom Phillips does on his pages. If you're familiar with his work, he'll uh, take a page and paint around it to create sort of a, a found poem kind of hidden within the text. And I'm kind of doing that in a physical way. And I started carving, when I started working with books, I was familiar with his work, but hadn't really even thought about how it applied to my work until I started using text and people began mentioning it. Um, so it really is uh, interesting the way you, you follow your own path, the way you kind of overlap with uh, what's been done before. Um, but what I really try to do, um, you know, when people ask me, who are you inspired by? I kind of think art should be the opposite. It should be an anti-inspiration to find out everything that's going on out there to try to find the territory, to find that route that hasn't really been traveled. So there's a lot of artists that, especially when you're starting out, you might just copy somebody else's work, but what, you know, to, to find the most unique, the most interesting work, it, it really should be the opposite, where you're kind of finding uh, inspiration from multiple sources. Um, you know, for me, a lot of my inspiration comes from science, from media theory, um, from philosophy, from poetry, um, and from visual art, of course. Uh, but of course, the book itself is the perfect format to uh, be able to explore all these things because the, the form of the book, the content of books, uh, of course, is endless and has uh, all of these different fields within it. So here, using the poetry, I sort of isolated the text one step further and created these pages, um, transcribing exactly where the text was within the original piece and kind of illustrating those clouds um, of information and really thinking about uh, concrete poetry, but also the way uh, information is sort of floating out there and uh, not accessible in a linear way uh, in a digital format. Um, this is one of my first prints. It's called uh, Chaos, and you can't really read it here. What I did was I looked up the word chaos in a thesaurus, and then it had six synonyms. And then I looked those six synonyms up, and there was 49, and then from that 49, 256, and it kept going on until there were several thousand. Um, and I stopped at uh, five layers. And I really wanted to create this, um, to map out the structure of a thesaurus, create this kind of a mandala that you could be engulfed in. The piece itself is five foot by seven foot. Um, but what I had discovered is the structure of the thesaurus itself really mirrors the structure of the internet, where, or even the, the way, the structure of the way we think, um, where you have 
one idea and that can lead to six other things. You can click on one of those things or you know, it leads to that thought and then that will take you down uh, to this progression or uh, digression um, into different uh, territories. So within this piece, the red words are the ones that were already used in a previous phase. So they sort of bounce back on themselves, uh, sort of this endless loop. The black words were the one are the ones that weren't in the thesaurus because it was a, you know, the thesaurus doesn't have every word in it. Um, and then the blue ones were the ones that were able to uh, to grow on. So just uh, like our own thoughts or our own uh, discovery through the internet. You're either progressing, you click on the next thing, sometimes you're bouncing back, sometimes your own thoughts can just kind of go in this, this loop, almost a mantra, um, and then sometimes your own thoughts, uh, you know, progress in a, a logical manner. So one of the things I'm trying to do with the book, uh, especially more recently, is think about its position in today's culture and the fact that um, the book is uh, becoming an artifact and people collect books, uh, especially older books, primarily not to read them, not for research, uh, but to have them as an object that uh, harkens back to a different time period, um, almost a different culture. Um, and you know, most of the things we find in a natural history museum weren't originally created to be art, uh, whether it be a totem pole or a stone sculpture that totem pole was a communication device and it was a sign essentially, um, not necessarily considered a sculpture. The, uh, uh, a wooden sculpture or a stone sculpture might have been a coin. Um, so as I'm transforming the book, I'm thinking about it, um, almost positioning it as an object that we could find in a natural history museum and uh, thinking of it as an artifact and in a way preserving and archiving it but at the same time completely manipulating its original uh, function, its original intent by putting it in a gallery or museum, um, which is what happens with uh, an African ceremonial mask or a totem pole that used to function in a certain way and wasn't created to just sit statically in a museum, um, but has uh, sort of fallen into that space uh, as time and culture has uh, I don't want to use the word progressed necessarily. <laughs> progressed or, you know, moved on. Um, so this is one full set of Encyclopedia Britannica. And this piece was created in, um, how are we doing on time? Good. Uh, this piece was created in 2012. And it was, I was actually working on it while Encyclopedia Britannica announced that they would no longer uh, create the printed edition. So um, in a way, it's sort of an elegy. It's sort of a monument. Um, so it can be sort of a, uh, you know, historic monument, but in a way it's also, it can be sort of a tombstone. Um, so when I started working with books around 2000 and, uh, still, you know, you could go to dictionary.com, but for the most part, even back then you'd still reference, uh, a dictionary, uh, quicker than you would go online. And the idea of using the calculator on your computer was just absurd. I remember thinking that was just the most bizarre thing. Um, you know, nobody could have, well, most people didn't really foresee that over the next 15, 20 years, uh, things would, uh, change so quickly. So as, um, the function of books continues to shift, the, the function or the meaning of my work, um, is sort of, uh, continuing to shift with it as well. So within this piece, each book itself is weaved into the next one. So it's just one solid piece, um, and then varnished before I actually carve into it. So this piece is called uh, First to Pass Through. And again, thinking of forms that we see in natural history museums, forms in uh, different cultures. Of course, the circular format uh, has been used through a variety of different cultures. Uh, so when I put this piece together, I really wanted it to be sort of a Mayan calendar, an Aztec calendar, um, also a zodiac, um, and uh, finding all those different um, circular formats from from different cultures. And of course, the book itself is uh, just loaded, saturated with references to all these different cultures. So I wanted uh, not only the content, but the form to sort of uh, reflect that. And also 
for this almost to be uh, a gate or uh, again in a way like a like a time machine that um, takes you back to a different time period but in a way sort of thinking of this almost as a the book is as a fictional machine that can kind of take you into a different place so instead of being read from front to back this piece of course can be read uh, you know in a an endless amount of directions and we can read the text or we can read images as well you can see some of the uh, some of the etchings within the book cover itself that uh, reference um, a mandala a Tibetan mandala as well um, the Aztec and the Mayan calendar and the zodiacs so it also becomes of course with the 12 it becomes a clock and it becomes a calendar as well Um, with digital technology, what's happening with the book is there is a violence, there is sort of a destruction. There's sort of a natural decay, but there's also this intentional destruction um, by uh, corporations to continue to uh, push technology forward, not necessarily to make it better for us, um, you know, every iPhone, what's, what's the difference, really? There's people that will line up for it, but <clears throat> they're only changing it so that you have to buy the new one. There's really nothing, you know, you just have to relearn it constantly. Um, and you don't have to do that with a book. You don't have to play around with the format. You can get right into the actual material. But as formats are changing, uh, it's an intentional distraction um, of course, I sound like I'm, it, you know, these, this is kind of getting on the edge of conspiracy theories. But um, I've never been on Facebook. Um, I'm finally on Instagram at Brian Detmer Studio, if you want to follow me. Of course, they're owned by Facebook. But, you know, what's happened with Facebook recently, everybody seems so shocked and so surprised. And I knew it all along. Everything that we're reading online is reading you at the same time. So there's a, a comfort in isolation, a... Uh, with, re with reading a book and knowing where you are and knowing what's happening. But now that everything's online, everything you're looking at is looking back at you and it's recording you. So nothing out there is free. Um, they're, they're getting something from you. And in a way, there's almost an intentional destruction, um, which I'm trying to illustrate. So thinking about that advent of technology and also um, these disturbing videos of, uh, that popped up a few years ago of ISIS um, intentionally erasing history, intentionally destroying monuments, and sort of this um, relationship between natural decay and intentional destruction, and the relationship between the book um, and architecture, and, uh, and you know, the book really being a representation of history itself. So it's a little, you know, a little bit of a stretch, of course. The, the violence that's happening to books is not as uh, as direct and as uh, destructive, and of course, I'm uh, participating in it in a physical way in order to illustrate uh, what's happening um, on a corporate level to the way we record and receive information. So, I really have thought about the book as a um, something that you know you might find in in ruins like as a fragment or as a an archaeological ruin um so i've been this is also just one single book and kind of pushing that format even further to kind of have this feeling like it came from uh a uh, an archaeological site or a site that had been destroyed and this idea that the information itself the format itself the history had been uh destroyed over time or intentionally um, and of course, this is almost a you know a science fiction idea again, where of course you would never find a book in this uh, form, but really you know using the book to uh, reflect um, what happens uh, with other materials, particularly you know stone within this. And of course, there's poetry within here that connects to the piece itself. So when I'm working with a history book, I think about memory. When I'm working with a uh, biology book, I'm thinking about the body. When I'm working with an archaeology book, I'm thinking about archaeology and, uh, of course, um, the way we record the past. So in a way, and this sort of uh, dwindles it down, uh, you know, in a humorous way, but I'm kind of creating 
an artwork derived from articles employing artifice to suggest an artifact becoming an artwork. And so it, um, you know, especially with these uh, most recent pieces. So um, I'm creating this fake artifact out of something that is actually becoming an artifact itself uh, in order to uh, illustrate that. So this was my first uh, Tristram Shandy piece that I did for Haverford College in 2013. They invited me, Haverford College is in Pennsylvania, and they had a class specifically on Tristram Shandy, and they invited me to have a show there and do a talk, and they uh, had me do a commission um, with Tristram Shandy. And I was familiar with the text, but, uh, or with the history of the book itself, um, but not too familiar. So I had done some research and found this copy that was really exciting to work with. And uh, that's when Patrick had um, reached out to me after seeing that I had worked with Tristram Shandy and invited me to uh, do a piece um, here in England. Uh, so this is the piece that I did that's uh, at Shandy Hall, and it's part of their permanent collection if you want to see it in person. Um, so I did this piece while I was here uh, over the course of two weeks um, about four years ago. So I took the two books and kind of, uh, it was a two volume edition and kind of folded them back in on themselves in order to uh, kind of then cut in to the surface from there. And what's exciting is uh, this book is really one of the first novels to kind of uh, break down that fourth wall and play with that structure uh, of time and also acknowledge the fact that there's a reader reading the book while you're reading it. Um, so there's really something uh, parallel between what my work is and what this novel uh, has, has, you know, really became, uh, really started to become. And really, um, it's interesting that uh, such a modern, contemporary uh, way of approaching the narrative uh, had uh, occurred so early on in the history of the novel. And uh, everybody sort of regressed and went back to the linear narrative um, for the most part. It really hasn't. You know, there's, there's a long history of experimental novels and experimental text, but this really was a groundbreaking piece that really uh, has a lot of humor and a lot of um, things that really still feel very uh, contemporary today. And that's it. Thank you.